Good morning. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, back in Odessa, uh, amongst you all. Uh, and I, I'm very grateful uh, to the organizers for inviting me today. Um, uh, it promises to be uh, a, a very interesting uh, conference. Um, I, uh, when I was first invited, um, I discussed uh, a little bit with uh, Yuri Gorodnichenko what I might uh, talk about. And we, we agreed I would talk about two things. Um, one is uh, about how to make uh, globalization more inclusive, uh, and the other uh, the role of uh, lack of inclusion, rising inequality, in making growth more fragile, um, uh, and so flipping that around, how to make uh, growth healthier and more um, sustainable, and particular what the role of inclusion and uh, 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 hopefully uh, more uh, equality at the national level uh, might have uh, in, in that goal. Um, I, uh, I have to give the uh, usual disclaimer, which is these are my own views and, and not the views uh, of my institution, the IMF. So um, let, me, let me sort of uh, give you a little bit the, uh, the narrative that I'm uh, going to pursue, which is that um, uh, we all know that um, uh, globalization as it's evolved over the past few decades um, has not been terribly inclusive. Um, and uh, a lot of the discussion, I think, um, and the, the dominant narrative is really that uh, we have to press ahead with uh, the globalization process um, because it has been so successful uh, at lifting so many millions and billions of people out of poverty uh, and raising average incomes le income levels uh, across the world. And that is... Sorry. And that is certainly true. Um, uh, and then there is a, a part two to the narrative, which is we have to work harder on complementary policies uh, to make globalization uh, more inclusive. So I sort of, I read the dominant narrative as uh, move forward pretty much in a business as usual way with respect to globalization itself, but, um, but uh, pursue a range of complementary policies um, that will make it more uh, inclusive. Um, so I, I don't see in that dominant narrative anything about thinking about the design of globalization itself, um, uh, whether we want to put any sand in the wheels of that process um, or, uh, or tweak the design in any particular way. Uh, it reminds me a little bit, um, the, the analogy is, is, is not perfect, but it's a little bit like uh, the debates we had a decade ago uh, about how we should deal with um, you know, asset and credit bubbles. Do we uh, try and uh, use a range of policies uh, to, um, you know, mitigate their inflation uh, during the boom years, or do we, as Alan Greenspan often argued, uh, simply do a good job uh, tidying up ex post? I think the dominant narrative on globalization is we will tidy up, we will pursue, um, uh, we will look after the losers in a sort of ex post way. Uh, and maybe I will uh, have uh, uh, something to say about that. And then the second part, of course, which is related to the first, is if globalization, um, which is being pursued not really to promote in inclusion, but to raise the average living standards across the, uh, across the globe, uh, if, uh, as a sort of part and parcel of uh, uh, increasing globalization, there is a systematic tendency for some people to be left behind, we have to ask whether uh, the excluded and the rising national inequalities that seem to be part and parcel uh, of globalization might itself, might themselves come back to bite you uh, 
uh, uh, uh, in your objective of promoting uh, high average sustained growth. So if uh, rising national inequalities um, are themselves an impediment um, uh, 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 for sustained growth, if rising national inequalities uh, are reflected in more fragile and, uh, and less healthy growth, then uh, even if you don't care uh, about rising national inequalities for um, uh, moral or social reasons, and we all have different views about what the social welfare function uh, might be, uh, I think you still uh, are forced, even from a narrow getting growth going sustainably perspective, you need to care uh, about what is going on with inequalities at the national level. Uh, because it may turn out, uh, uh, as I've uh, argued uh, in some recent work, that uh, high or rising uh, levels of national inequalities are uh, reflected in more fragile, less sustainable growth. Um, the only other preamble comment I want to make is, uh, the nature of this audience means I I'm not going to uh, present a technical uh, presentation today. I'm going to do something that's uh, more uh, a kind of storytelling narrative kind of analysis. Um, but for the uh, more academically minded amongst you, um, uh, this work is all based on uh, rigorously argued, uh, vetted academic publications uh, in journals like the AER and the EJ and the JIE and so forth. And uh, by way of shameless advertising, it's based on, on two books uh, that uh, uh, I've co-authored uh, and that will be coming out. Uh, well, the first one will be coming out, which is on uh, aspects of financial globalization, uh, this year published by MIT Press, uh, probably launched uh, at the end of the year. And the second will be on uh, rising national inequalities, uh, what is behind them and what to do about them, which will be published by Columbia University Press next year. So, so I've done my advertising for those, for those two books. Good. Good. So, um, I mean, uh, you, you're, you're all familiar with this narrative, which is uh, the tremendous benefits that globalization has, has brought, um, uh, lifting average living standards across the, the globe, uh, narrowing gaps across countries in average living st standards. But you're equally aware uh, that the gains have not been shared um, uh, broadly and that there have been uh, a range of people uh, left behind in all countries. Um, and you're also aware that this has led to a backlash in some quarters against globalization. And the fear uh, I think that we all share is that uh, if that backlash takes hold, uh, we could end up with the worst of both worlds, uh, neither integration uh, nor the uh, accompanying growth and welfare benefits, nor inclusion. So the Great Depression uh, is not an example either of rising average living standards or of a particularly inclusive period uh, in, in economic history. Now, the, the mainstream view, I think, is, as I said, that we should keep the forward momentum going of globalization. Uh, and hopefully uh, the rising average living standards that would result um, will somehow pacify uh, to some degree those who are left behind, those who are discontented. One danger I see is that, um, you know, pursuit of this approach will be regarded as business as usual by the discontented and might actually lead to more populism and nationalism, which would then undercut the ability of policymakers to pursue this approach. So one question that I ask is whether, uh, you know, we should pause a little bit from, from uh, keep pedaling forward on this bicycle uh, and ask whether there are any areas uh, in the design of globalization that we might want to tweak uh, to make it uh, more inclusive from the design phase. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a, a, about a rather narrow piece uh, of, of that uh, question, but I think a piece that's uh, 
completely been out of the debates which have really been focusing on trade and migration uh, aspects of globalization. I'm going to be talking about the globalization of finance, which I think is a, is a, is a fruitful area for further discussion. Um, so uh, the, the, the second uh, area that I want to pursue is this connection between inequality and growth. Um, and uh, you know, many of you will recognize uh, what is on this slide. Um, uh, you know, really what I call the dominant macroeconomic narrative, which is that we really should focus on growth and not its distribution. Um, that in essence, growth will trickle down uh, that redistribution, uh, because it undercuts uh, economic incentives, can be uh, deeply harmful to growth. I don't know if, uh, if some of you heard uh, one of Tom Sargent's speeches um, after he won the Nobel Prize, arguing about uh, some 10 basic economic truths, but essentially the second bullet on this slide was really one of the, the central economic truths um, that uh, Tom Sargent put put forward uh, there. Um, and I think part of the, the dominant narrative is that we also, to some degree, uh, know what will deliver uh, growth. Uh, a range of structural reforms, liberalization, deregulation, uh, greater openness to trade, to capital, to, to foreign workers, and of course macroeconomic stability, uh, low public debt, low inflation, macro rigor. Uh, the, the roots of, that, uh, of those ideas go back a long way. I mean, I've put up a quote from Schumpeter, which, uh, which I think uh, encapsulates it nicely. Uh, when I did my PhD at Chicago, uh, the thinking of uh, Bob Lucas, who was one of my advisors uh, in this middle quote, um, I think uh, was very well known. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the last quote, uh, which is perhaps uh, less well known, but w really is a springboard for my talk, uh, which I read, of the tendencies that are, harmful to sound, that are harmful to sound economics, the most seductive, and in my opinion, the most poisonous, is to focus on questions of distribution. So I, I think I'm, I'm going to politely disagree um, with, with that notion. That's terrible. You know. Sorry about this, but this uh, clicker is not the best. Okay. Uh, I think, by and large, countries have, have listened to the dominant uh, narrative. Uh, they have pursued supply-side policies uh, with a range of deregulation uh, type of measures. Uh, and I think the, the, the sense that governments can get too big and fatty and, and uh, overburden the economy is also one uh, that has been uh, well heard across the globe. Um, I, I'm going to argue for, for a slightly different uh, approach to these questions which is that uh, we need to analyze uh, growth and distribution together. So um, the, the notion that a focus on distribution is fundamentally uh, counterproductive, as in the last quote from Bob Lucas, I think is mistaken. And uh, really, um, uh, we are going to have to learn to, to walk and chew gum at the same time. Because uh, if I'm right, as I'm going to argue in a minute, that um, a failure to focus on distribution might itself undercut the ability uh, to uh, sustain growth in a healthy way. Uh, it would be a dangerous gamble to uh, fall into the trap of saying, let's just get growth going and we'll deal with distribution after. We might have to deal with both together. Um, the other thing is that, you know, across an, you know, the full gamut of economic policies um, that, we, that we consider as policymakers and, and uh, in academia, 
I think many of these policies uh, pose equity efficiency trade-offs. And so whenever there are these trade-offs, you, uh, you want to take into account in the design phase of the policies uh, the distributional effects, even if the primary purpose of those policies is not a distributional one, but one that is designed to, to grow the pie uh, larger. And, you know, these different areas, I'm not going to talk about them all today, but uh, I have a paper on, uh, you know, growth equity trade-offs in structural reforms. Uh, I have um, uh, uh, papers on um, uh, the role of, uh, you know, what fiscal consolidation does to distributional um, uh, issues. Uh, and I'm going to talk mainly about the, the middle one today, so it ties into the, to the globalization theme, which is, you know, how uh, the globalization of finance um, uh, uh, affects both distribution uh, and the aggregate uh, uh, outcomes, efficiency outcomes. Um, so, you know, to give you the punchline of, the, uh, of my work on, on growth and inequality, um, you know, the title of, of, of one of the papers is that, uh, you know, fragile growth and rising inequality are two sides of the same coin, and that's the, that's the point that's uh, developed uh, in that paper. Um, Virtually all policies pose uh, equity efficiency trade-offs. Uh, for example, many supply-side policies, deregulation policies, uh, will deliver uh, increased growth, but um, they will also tend uh, to have distributional uh, consequences. Uh, globalization, as we all know, um, uh, doesn't, uh, as, a, as a matter of theory or practice, uh, work for all, and I'm going to um, uh, focus mostly on financial globalization here. Uh, what, what we are able to document is that episodes of financial opening, uh, indeed very much like S episodes of domestic financial deregulation, uh, I don't, I'm not going to talk about that today, but it is related to other work we are doing. Um, these episodes tend to be followed by rising inequality um, and in the case of external financial liberalization, not the case of domestic, uh, little aggregate benefits uh, for growth, and of course, rising volatility. Not going to talk about the last one, it's in another paper, but uh, ep episodes of austerity, I think uh, it's, it's become well known, uh, have a, a, a short-term growth cost. Of course, that's not a reason uh, that they may not be needed in certain uh, circumstances, uh, especially when markets have, uh, have cut you off. But there are uh, episodes where countries, uh, I think, uh, pursue uh, fiscal consolidation out of some desire to bring about uh, a lower national debt level, even though they are not um, uh, really being pressured by markets to do so. So they, they have a choice, as it were. They, are, they have plenty of fiscal space. They are in a green zone, uh, what we call in our paper a green zone as far as fiscal space. And nevertheless, they do uh, uh, pursue fiscal consolidation uh, under the guise of sort of uh, increasing their room for maneuver in case bad things happen tomorrow, and also to lay a, a firmer foundation for long-term growth. But what uh, oftentimes these situations don't take into account is that the transition from high debt to low debt itself involves um, uh, either you know, raising taxes or cutting productive expenditures, and there is an economic cost to engage in, engaging in those fiscal consolidation episodes, both for uh, uh, aggregate growth and also on the distributional side. But I, 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 won't, I won't go into that today. So, um, you know, one of the things uh, that, that you will recognize is sort of some, some tie-in to recent debates. I mean, we all, I think, um, uh, you know, share to some degree uh, concern about the impact of rising inequalities, a lack of, uh, you know, a lack of inclusion on, on, uh, from a social, uh, social point of view, a moral point of view, political capture by the elites, etc. Uh, one of the things that we want to stress is that there is a direct economic cost to rising inequality. It tends to make growth uh, uh, lower and uh, less sustainable, le uh, less durable. Um, you know, 
there has been a lot of uh, uh, concern uh, about uh, distributional effects of trade uh, uh, from migration, but I, I want to put on the table uh, an under-discussed area, uh, which is financial globalization. I would say two things. It, 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 our finding is that it contributes as much to rising national inequalities as trade and indeed uh, as uh, technological change. Um, uh, but it also, uh, you know, and, and it contributes, uh, we, we have evidence that it contributes um, to uh, reduced bargaining power of workers and lower labor shares, so it's one of the factors behind that. Um, and, you know, when we think about uh, really trying to have a more inclusive uh, approach uh, to trade uh, integration, uh, what it means is that we are going to have to um, apply uh, more fiscal resources, uh, amongst uh, other things, to um, uh, uh, you know, bring the excluded, the losers from trade globalization, uh, bring them to a situation where they can uh, have uh, productive jobs with dignity that are, that are, um, uh, uh, that are sustainable. Um, and one of the concerns I have about financial globalization is that uh, we find evidence that it makes uh, the task of fiscal redistribution more difficult because um, there is evidence of a race to the bottom uh, in terms of taxation, um, which makes uh, fiscal redistribution uh, that much more difficult. So it's going to make um, uh, making people whole as a result of trade globalization uh, that much harder. Okay, um, so I'm going to zoom through uh, some of these things. Now, I'm, as, I, you know, as I said, I, I'm not going to go through the, the, the models and the um, issues of causality uh, that are covered in, in the, in the uh, academic papers that, that um, have come out or are coming out in the next few months. But let me just say that just based on um, uh, the raw data, uh, I think uh, there is some evidence, some quite persuasive evidence, that um, higher levels of inequality uh, tend to be followed by uh, lower growth uh, over the next five or ten year periods. Uh, and then when you think of redistribution, um, uh, there isn't a lot of evidence uh, that it is particularly harmful. In fact, uh, the, the, you know, the correlation here uh, seems to be close to zero. If anything, it, it goes uh, the wrong way. Um, and, you know, we, we have done a, a lot of empirical work uh, controlling for all the other uh, standard determinants of growth, uh, trying to take into account uh, causality issues uh, insofar as we are able to do so. And what we, we come out with is that, in fact, um, uh, inequality uh, on average uh, over the past several decades across uh, countries developing, emerging, advanced um, has been harmful to average growth. And that redistribution far from being uh, a, 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 a big uh, cost, uh, far from carrying a large growth cost, because of the uh, greater equality that it induces, can be a win-win uh, policy on average. It can uh, improve equality uh, and, uh, in so doing, uh, raise economic growth. Um, and, of course, there are a variety of channels through, this, uh, through which this might occur. Uh, when you improve access to uh, health, to education, to nutrition, to the credit markets, indeed to the political process from uh, those uh, who are excluded, there is uh, a decent chance that these people will become more productive citizens and will help you uh, grow at a higher rate. Um, one of the things that we also looked at uh, uh, in, um, uh, in some uh, recent work, we, we asked sort of what makes growth sustained rather than what uh, raises the average level of growth. And the idea really is that um, when you are trying to close the gap between rich and poor countries, what is important is not so much getting growth going, igniting growth, it is really the ability to sustain growth for very long periods of time. time. 
decades or more. Um, and the, the economic success stories are, um, are really those countries that have been able uh, to uh, not only ignite growth, which is a rather common uh, phenomenon observed across the, the globe, uh, common also uh, and includes many countries whose economic policies one might think of as really, you know, basket cases. So the ability to ignite short-term uh, growth spurts is, is, uh, is, is common and not particularly helpful uh, in closing uh, uh, average income gaps between poor and rich countries. The ability to uh, sustain growth over long periods of time uh, is much rarer. And um, what we wanted to ask, um, using you know, techniques that are borrowed from the, the medical literature, which sort of asks you know, these hazard models, asks you know, what are your chances of having a heart attack in uh, X periods of times? What are the uh, proximate determinants of a healthy period of life? Uh, what, are, what, what kinds of things, whether it's exercise, diet, or whatever, uh, enable you to, uh, to prevent uh, 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 an end of a healthy growth spell? So here we ask, what kinds of things uh, will extend uh, a healthy growth spell, a period of, of strong positive growth? And we, we find many uh, things that are, are typically included in, in the Washington consensus, but one of the things that really stands out is um, uh, a, a relatively equal uh, distribution of income. So societies that are relatively more equal uh, tend to grow in a more sustainable fashion. Um, and redistribution, uh, again here, on average, uh, doesn't seem to... Um, uh, have a cost in terms of uh, being able to sustain growth. And again, that was just the data. Again, there's a lot of modeling uh, and uh, trying to control for, for, take account of causality and control for other uh, uh, determinants of growth, growth duration. But here is a graphic um, that sort of encapsulates the finding. And what it says is that on average, um, uh, inequality is harmful to the sustainability uh, of growth. More inequality tends to uh, render growth more fragile. Uh, and then redistribution, on average, uh, tends to again be a win-win uh, policy, uh, with, with one exception. If you are already doing a lot of redistribution, so in, in, our, in our sample, um, uh, if you're in the top quartile of the redistribution distribution across the globe, doing further redistribution is probably uh, uh, not going to be helpful for growth. But if you're in the bottom three quartiles, and if you're an average redistributor, doing a little bit more redistribution is, uh, is not going to uh, harm you directly, and through the greater equality that such redistribution induces is actually going to help you grow more sustainably. Um, uh, so so uh, that basically uh, is, is uh, our finding here. Now I, I'm going to switch gears and come back to the globalization issues and then wrap up at the end. So I, I argued at the beginning that um, uh, helpful as the discussion on trade and migration is, I think uh, we need to look a little bit more at another aspect of globalization, which is the globalization of finance. Um, I had uh, uh, the privilege to organize an event uh, in May uh, and invited Paul Krugman to, to give the keynote. Um, uh, and uh, Paul started out really by putting uh, two, two charts up uh, on the board, one uh, showing the steady progress of, uh, of trade integration over many, many decades, um, and another uh, showing the steady progress of financial globalization over many, many decades. Uh, and he asked uh, the assembled, which included uh, a number of ministers, central bank governors, as well as academics, whether uh, the feeling in the room was the same in relation to both facets of globalization, and he conjectured, rightly as it turned out, uh, that um, uh, people have a much more uh, welcoming feeling in relation to trade globalization in terms of the benefits that it has yielded, 
um, uh, than they have about financial globalization, which is remembered uh, much more, he conjectured, for the kinds of crises and volatility that it has engendered rather than the lifting of, um, of average folks uh, out of poverty and uh, the ability of them to, to grow uh, more sustainably. And of course, this kind of a, a cautious approach, approach in relation to financial globalization is, uh, has a long pedigree uh, in economics. Keynes was very uh, worried about um, uh, financial globalization uh, back in the 30s. He worried, in fact, it would make trade globalization uh, much more difficult. But I think that the quotes that I have in the middle of the slide uh, sort of show that uh, people from uh, very different uh, political and economic policy angles uh, share a healthy skepticism about the benefits, the average benefits um, uh, that uh, financial globalization uh, might engender. And uh, uh, our own work um, in, in one of the books I mentioned that we're doing, um, that is done, uh, uh, you know, um, that is coming out, one of the chapters of that book really summarizes um, all of the available evidence on the empirical effects of financial globalization. And I think I would summarize it as in that first uh, bullet that really there is, that the evidence is really quite weak and mixed of sizable growth or risk sharing benefits from financial globalization. Uh, that is not true of trade where there is much more persuasive evidence of, of strong growth effects. Uh, there, is, there is indisputable evidence of uh, effects of financial globalization on volatility. Again, not true of trade. Um, and of, co of course, support for trade uh, is going to require uh, a, a greater use of fiscal resources to remedy the distributional impacts. And as I mentioned uh, a, a second ago, um, financial globalization may uh, make uh, uh, you know, those uh, resources for redistributive purposes more difficult to obtain because when there is a lot of mobile footloose capital, um, uh, countries uh, uh, tend to engage in, uh, in sort of tax reducing wars and there's, a, there's what some people have called a race to the bottom on taxes. Um, financial globalization, though, makes the distributional challenges even greater. So uh, we, have, we have sort of uh, this problem coming at us from both sides. And of course, as I argued in the first part of the presentation, uh, the equity challenges from all directions are, are uh, directly challenging the sustainability of growth. Um, so, uh, you know, some people, I, you know, oftentimes when I talk about these issues, you know, we get the sense that uh, rising national inequalities is a U.S. and a few other countries uh, uh, phenomenon. But in fact, I think it is a, is a broad issue at the national level uh, across the globe, uh, enveloping many, many different kinds of countries and across our membership. Um, and, and you know, as I mentioned, uh, this issue of rising national inequalities is of concern for uh, the guardians of globalization because both higher inequality and uh, reduced social spending and a reduced focus, excessive caution about redistribution, I think there is some um, uh, evidence that uh, uh, that lies behind, uh, you know, rising uh, uh, support for protectionism and nativist uh, kind of policies. So, so we need to be concerned. Um, our work on examining two to three hundred, all the available genuine episodes of large financial opening, external financial uh, opening up episodes suggests that on average, the growth benefits have been minuscule. Um, and that is an average number that reflects averaging across situations where countries have opened up but avoided crises and countries that have opened up and had nasty crises, crises with, with very bad growth uh, consequences. Um, in a paper we had earlier this year in, in the AER papers and proceedings, we documented the extent to which uh, financial inflow surges uh, lead 
to uh, busts, uh, busts of such severity that they result uh, in um, full-blown financial or other kinds of crisis. And, and what we show that the, the capital flow reversals in those situations are indeed uh, associated with very large uh, growth costs. So an, an old story, but one that I think we have updated with, with the latest information. Um, people will say, well, you're looking under the wrong lamppost. We're not going to see aggregate effects uh, using macro data. Uh, you need to look at it at the sectoral level, uh, and you need to see whether firms and sectors that rely more on external finance uh, indeed uh, have the, the, the benefits that one would, would tend to see in theory. Um, uh, and we, 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 we do this, and we find some evidence uh, uh, for that. I'm not sure um, they would make a, a front page news in the, in the Financial Times or get as a leader in The Economist. They are there. Uh, 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 they are statistically relevant. They're not that large. But again, conditioning on, um, you know, uh, whether the economy in the end had a crisis or not, whether uh, it meets certain thresholds of financial depth and inclusion, these conditioning effects uh, do also matter uh, in terms of the sectoral responses. Um, but, and I think this is important, episodes of financial opening um, uh, do seem to lead to average increases in inequality. Inequality rises uh, quite, quite sizably uh, I think, uh, in the aftermath of uh, these opening episodes. I think I say quite sizably because Tony Atkinson uh, has views, or the late Tony Atkinson has views on um, what, you know, what thresholds of, uh, of, in terms of Gini points, uh, need to be achieved before we, we worry about this from a policy standpoint. And I think uh, we, we meet our test, we meet his test here. Um, uh, it's true on average, and it's of course uh, the crisis, no crisis um, uh, division is also uh, relevant, but it matters on average. Um, some people say, okay, you're looking at sort of de jure changes in laws um, that result uh, in a country being classified from initially financially closed to financially open, but you know, is it the actual surges and crashes uh, in, in actual financial flows that are behind uh, your inequality story? Uh, and indeed it is, um, the, the, you know, the inequality is far worse when uh, capital flood, floods in uh, than in cases where uh, the opening uh, does not uh, result in a big increase in capital flows. Um, I mentioned this already, but there is an effect on, on, on labor shares that I think is uh, uh, very, very statistically and, and economically salient. And um, I mean, you might ask what's behind this. Uh, I would mention a couple of things. One is, you know, in a, in a sort of very neoclassical model, when you lower uh, the cost of capital, uh, which a financial opening uh, uh, allows you to do, um, if the elasticity of substitution between labor and capital is greater than one, you will observe, uh, you will observe falling labor shares. Um, uh, in addition, um, of course, if uh, the threat to, uh, to move capital offshore um, uh, is, is salient, then the, the bargaining power of labor is going to be reduced. So uh, that could be uh, uh, another, uh, another mechanism. Um, and, and, and again, here I don't want to oversell these statistical results. Uh, there is more work behind this. But what I, what I would say is that we observe that following episodes of financial opening, uh, countries engage in less rather than more redistribution even as I think the case for additional redistribution is actually growing because financial opening is leading to rising national inequalities and to the degree that it's also accompanied by uh, further trade opening, then by both tokens, uh, you would want to see more, uh, a greater role uh, of the state, uh, not only in redistribution, 
but also in facilitating, uh, you know, pre-distribution policies, say, uh, improving access to, um, to education and health uh, and job training and so forth, which again uh, costs money. Um, some people will say, uh, and I alluded to this at the beginning, all this trade and financial globalization is small beer in what we've observed uh, in terms of rising national inequalities. Our own work is when you try and control for as many, many possible drivers, and admittedly, we don't have a uh, spelled out in the textbooks model of what the causes of rising inequalities are. So you have to be a little uh, creative and ec eclectic. But when we allow the data to speak, uh, technology is surely important, technical change is important, trade is important, but finance is as important and certainly belongs in the pantheon of things we should be thinking about uh, as to what's behind rising national inequalities. Um, it's not all dark. There are things that governments can do. Um, uh, you know, a less cautious attitude to redistribution uh, can go a long way to making financial globalization uh, result in, um, in, in better distributional outcomes. Paying attention to financial inclusion policies uh, is, is, is also helpful uh, and important. So my last slide um, uh, is really, you know, I think uh, there is a sense, you know, from my reading of, of the policy debate that um, we should distinguish more in, in, in our quest to save globalization uh, between trade and finance. Um, the evidence on financial globalization, uh, to my reading, is that the costs in terms of increased volatility are high, uh, the output benefits are elusive and shared unevenly. Uh, and there are other effects that we should worry about, like a race to the bottom on tax to, taxes uh, and a, a lessened ability of governments to engage in needed redistribution. Uh, we should be asking uh, uh, more about how we can design policies ex ante uh, to uh, improve the benefit-cost ratio uh, uh, as, as globalization uh, proceeds. Um, and I think, uh, you know, on finance, um, I think uh, one of the things, uh, you know, we should be looking more at is not so much the use of um, capital account regulations and macroprudential policies to manage the cycle of boom and bust, but really um, also more structural measures uh, that would enable countries to achieve a better mix of capital flows in favor of flows that are uh, likely to improve um, uh, growth and risk sharing uh, benefits for the country uh, and reduce volatility uh, costs. Um, and of course, sequencing matters. Um, uh, we need to pay more attention to uh, financial depth and inclusion before we emb embark on further moves to uh, uh, deregulate external finance, um, and, you know, things like financial inclusion and redistribution can result in uh, better outcomes, uh, both on the distributional side and through that on the growth side. Thank you.